if you don't know that you're being exposed to lead or PCBs, um, then you can't do anything about it. Hi, everyone. Kaya Perowit here, one of the producers of the Doctor's Pharmacy podcast. Before we get started with this week's episode, we have a quick word from our sponsor, which happens to be Dr. Hyman's new company, Pharmacy. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is, what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC, and I call that system the 10-day reset. The 10-Day Reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, click on the button below or visit GetPharmacy.com. That's GetPharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's Pharmacy with an F, uh, a place for conversations that matter. And if you care about the role of environmental toxins in our health and you're worried you might be affected, this is a conversation you need to pay close attention to because it's with an extraordinary woman, a brilliant mind, Harriet Washington, who has written a book uh, that was extraordinarily disturbing, incredibly revealing, and powerful indictment of a different form of racism in this country, environmental racism. Uh, we'll talk about that book in a minute, but she's uh, been the Shearing Fellow at the University of Nevada's Black Mountain Institute, a research fellow in medical ethics at Harvard Medical School, a senior researcher at the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee University, and a visiting scholar at DePaul University College of Law. She has held fellowships at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in Stanford University, and she's the author of Deadly Monopolies, Infectious Madness, and Medical Apartheid. Well, that's an interesting set of titles. She won, um, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Oakland Award, and the American Library Association of Black Caucus Nonfiction Award. She's an incredible writer. I read her stuff. It's very good. So welcome, Harriet. Thank you. Now, we're going to have a tough conversation today because it's stuff people don't like to talk about, which is one, environmental toxins, and two, racism, and three, the destruction of the American mind. Uh, your title of your book is A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind. And you've been covering the intersection of race, medicine, health, and ethics for years. Uh, this is your, one of your latest works, and it's an indictment of this whole idea that there's hereditary intelligence, that certain races are inferior, uh, which I think is still <laughs> kind of a thing in people's mind, but uh, we, we do have a legitimate challenge with people of color in this country. And the challenge is that they're not inferior, but they've been treated inferiorly, which has led to forms of racism that are insidious and are not just about police brutality or discrimination. They're about the destruction of the intellectual capital of generations of poor and minorities that are targeted in ways that are a little bit invisible, both by the food industry, which I talk a lot about a lot, but also uh, segregation and redlining in ways that actually make them much more likely to be exposed to environmental toxins. So can you discuss, Harriet, how communities of color in America are being poisoned due to decisions and policies that expose them to these dangerous levels of toxins and how this poisoning has horrifying cognitive symptoms that are evidenced by the effects on our IQ? It happens as an illustration that in 2019, we understand that race has no biological reality. In biological sense, race is not real, but racism is very real. Mm. And people's health status tends to reflect the race that they are perceived as belonging to. Mm -hmm. um, policies that are political policies, academic policies, are come actually a confluence of many policies that do um, adopt race as a reality that address race, that believe in race, um, have conspired to force out, to, 
to actually trap African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Native Americans mm -hmm. in environments that are that are wholly toxic. Whether you're talking about nutrition or you're talking about environmental exposures. Um, it's a confluence of uh, policies. One can pick almost any of these. I mean, one, if you look at the political um, pressures, well, we have historically segregation, which was um, physical force used to constrain African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Native Americans into living in certain areas. Those areas, Reservations are the classic example, right? They are, except that most Native Americans don't live on the reservation. Yeah. What they live on are equally assailed communities that don't have even the feeble legal protection of being in a reservation yes. covered by treaty. Yes. So, um, and of course, African Americans have been, uh, and Hispanics, of course, have been constrained by actual laws in this country, which until the 1960s, you know, legally mandated segregation, de jure segregation, trapped people in unhealthy areas. When whites were able to um, engage in white flight, moving to the suburb and suburban areas that didn't have any lead poisoning, yeah. that weren't being poisoned by um, fuel exhaust, black people and Hispanics couldn't follow them. No. Because even at the end of legal segregation, we had de facto segregation. Meaning? And meaning that even though the law did not constrain them to living in these areas, many other policies did. Uh, redlining, uh, racially discriminant mortgage policies. Wait, wait, wait. What's redlining? People don't know what redlining oh, well, is. Well, redlining is simply when you take an area that contains people of color, in this case, or, or other um, marginalized minorities, you take people of color, and then you actually write your policies so as to minimize their access to the system. It's like a form of gerrymandering, yes. you know, only now we're doing it in terms of things that people need to live, in terms of places to live. So are, they, are these Ooh. actual like regulations or legislation these are or policies? actual policies. And some are more transparent than others. Some are easier to see than others. For example, um, it's difficult to get private companies to open up their books and then see that the policies they've written for lending, pe mortgages, actually affect people of color. Ah. Um, they're not going to be so foolish in the vast majority of cases as to say, we don't want to lend to black people. But they can do things like saying, these are particular areas in which we don't want to invest. Yes. Those areas happen to be where black people live. Sure. So a confluence of all these policies traps black people in the area. Now whites have uh, fled to the suburbs, but black people can't follow them there. Because they don't have the economic resources? No, it's, because it's not economics. It's actually race. Because, um, I mean, they, they can't buy a house in, in a white neighborhood? They can't buy a house in a white neighborhood because the whites don't want them there. It's not a matter of, you know, the redlining in mortgage systems is a good example. Um, African Americans with sufficient income and sufficient credit still cannot get the same access to suburban housing because of redlining. Because they, um, banks have decided we are not going to invest in mortgages and people who live in this area. Yeah. Okay, so that's what's happened. I remember my own father, when we had, my parents were in the army, when we moved from Germany to Rochester, New York in the 1960s, my father left the army, took the GI Bill, and planned to buy us a house in the suburbs. He couldn't do it. Nobody would sell him a house. And to be perfectly honest with you, I knew he tried very hard, but I think always in the back of my mind, I think there was something thinking, maybe there were other things that could be done. You, you, know, you never know. Yeah. But then, um, Walter Cooper, a um, chemist at Eastman Kodak with a doctorate, and later an executive at Eastman Kodak, documented for the local newspaper where I worked, his long odyssey to buy his house, up, his family a house in the suburbs. It took him years. And he was an African American. He was an African American. He was a PhD chemist. He was an executive at Eastman Kodak, but nobody would would sell him a house in the suburbs. It took him a very long time and multiple lawsuit yeah. threats before he finally was able to buy. And, and these and these properties that are in these underserved communities. I, I I work in Cleveland, and and you know people talk about Flint, Michigan, and the decisions by the governor there and the state to actually. Uh, you know, allowed diversion of the water that created all this problems with the lead poisoning. Uh, the, the children in Cleveland have higher lead levels than those affected in Flint, Michigan, because of the lead paint in the houses and these dilapidated houses that they live in, and these horrible neighborhoods that that they can't get out of. I always say that Flint and Newark and Pittsburgh don't have lead poisoning problems. America has a lead poisoning problem. Mm -hmm. You can go to any metropolitan area in this country and you will find the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. People of color are trapped in areas where they're exposed to a heavy dose of lead and other toxic metals like arsenic. Um, and also, you know, a bevy of other um, toxic 
chemicals. But this is, this picture is an American picture. It's something that you will find in any metropolitan area. The only exception is, interestingly, certain areas of Washington, D.C., not all of Washington, D.C., but I was a little mystified about why certain areas of Washington, D.C., when um, poisonous metals and um, leftover pesticides were found to taint the, the soil and water, quickly were cleaned up. And I found out later it's because legislators live there. Yeah. Congress people live there. Yeah. You know, people whose lives that we, we value mm -hmm. live there. So um, it's a consistent pattern. As you say, it's not Flint, it's the entire nation. So some of these are they're the sort of like unspoken sort of policies. Some of these are more hardwired into the like legal and, and legislative system, right? Well, you know, the legal system reflects people's attitudes. That's the interesting thing. I mean, we don't have a legal system that is going to enact the same policies for everybody, right? So um, it, like every, all our other policies, is subject to the whims, including the whim of racism. Mm. So, um, and then also a lot of the poisoning is not strictly legal, but it happens anyway. What do you mean? Well, for example, if you look at what happened in Afton, North Carolina, a very interesting inversion of uh, criminality. You had in um, New York, North Carolina, there were these two men um, in the 1980s who had poisonous oil from their um, transformer business in New York, in New York uh, State, not New York City. And it was very expensive to dispose of this oil, you know, legally. You had to, you know, pay a lot of money to properly neutralize it and bury it and, and do all these studies to make sure it's away from people. Instead, they put the oil on trucks and they drove through the night to dump it along the roadways in North Carolina. And then they drove back to New York. Mm. They were eventually caught out. They found out it was them. One of them actually went to jail very briefly, unfortunately. Wow. But um, North Carolina then had a problem. They had all this roadway, long swathes of roadway, saturated with poisonous oil. Wow. They said, we have to take this and take it away from work. It won't harm people. They decided to, to dump it all in Afton, North Carolina. They did this with the blessing of the EPA. So in other words, they took the stuff that was on the roadways, they cleaned yeah, they it up, took, and they took it they all took and put all it into Afton, All the dirt saturated with oil yeah. and decided to dump it in Afton. Wow. And when asked why Afton, they said, well, our studies show it's the best place to dispose of. But it wasn't like the place where the oil would be dissipated more quickly. It wasn't farthest away from human habitation. Mm. It wasn't where the um, you know poison would not affect wildlife and humans. It's where black people lived. Yeah. So the black people in the area did not take the sitting down. They said, we don't want PCBs to um, inundate our communities. So they began doing old-fashioned civil rights protests. They, went, they took to the streets with placards and signs, marching, passively, um, passive um, resistance, and there were a lot of white allies, people who didn't live in the area, but who were sympathetic to their plight. Yeah. So they, did, they protested for six weeks. Wow. And if you look at these old newsreels, what you'll find is you have the sheriff's department there and the legal department arresting people, and through the bullhorns, they're, they're talking about law and order, they're trying to institute law and order. These are criminals. We're going to arrest them, treat them like criminals. But who are really the criminals here? Yeah. It wasn't the protesters. No. It was the people who dumped the oil illegally. Frankly, it was also the government that decided to dump it in a black community. Yeah. So we see this often when you look at the history of these exposures, that there's often criminal activity that is um, either hidden or the people complaining. A lot of blame the victim going on. People who complain about being affected are often cast as criminals. Yeah. So let's talk about our children because <laughs> I think, you know, this is something that people all can get behind. You, you know, I, I think I, I just was telling you earlier, I, I remember the story of this kid who lived in a town uh, near Albany, New York that had a giant cement plant and cement plants are run through coal burning and it was right next to the school and every day the school was coated in this dust of basically coal ash which is lead and mercury and the kid had behavioral issues had academic issues had struggles with his brain um and his mother brought him to see me and we treated him and we found that he had high levels of lead and mercury in his system and we got rid of it and he really dramatically improved but not everybody has access to someone like me to diagnose and treat this but this is a real widespread problem so Lead poisoning has come way down, thank God. 
but we're learning that even low levels of lead can have an impact. So we used to think the level was 40 was safe, then it was 20, then it was 10, and now studies show that even down to one or less, there's impairment of, of IQ and cognitive function. And so the so we've had this sort of staggering effects uh, to our population, but it's still happening in communities of color in disproportionate ways uh, that harms millions of people, that affects their intellectual development, that provides you know these horrible deadly environments that are 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 robbing communities of color of the ability to succeed in life of their full intellectual capacity and and really affecting america as a whole so can you tell us the connection between these environmental toxins and our intelligence and iq and and how that how that actually works well of course you're right and the cdc has um, stipulated that there is no threshold for lead exposure that any amount of lead exposure is dangerous. Yeah, people say, what's but, the normal blood level of lead or mercury? I'm like, zero. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what it should be. That should be the normal. <laughs> However, to say that lead has gone down is not actually true. It's gone down over the nation as a whole. Right. But if you look at places where pockets of children of color, yes, it is not. That's gone what down. I mean. Yeah, that's where people are exposed. I mean, yeah, I knew it's exactly what you want, wanted to convey. So that's the problem. We now have it limited to pockets of um, children who live in these areas. Once again, as I said, people who are trapped in the area, either by either by economics or by race or by both. Um, race actually tends to be the larger factor here, but economics is a factor as well. So you're living in areas that our government has decided not to clean up. And um, that's part of the problem. Um, could you repeat your question? So the, really the question is how does um, lead and other environmental toxins rob us of our intelligence and uh, our IQ? In a myriad of ways. And of course it depends on the toxin. But one of the most profound things I think that is not really understood about these exposures is that although we can trace lead's many multifactorial effects on the body, including um, brain damage mm -hmm. that is subtle enough not to be diagnosed very often. What happens is you have children who are exposed antenatally, or, you know, what? when the damage can be the worst. Yeah, but oh, then, prenatally. But what happens is that, um, antenatal, that's what I meant. Yeah. 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 But what happens is that um, it's, off, it's not diagnosed until problems appear, and then it's not diagnosed as lead poisoning. Part of the problem is when you have an exposure that precedes the... Um, discovered symptoms by 13 or 14 years, or even by 20 years, it's really hard to tie it to the initial exposure. Right. So what's happening with a lot of African-American children is they're being exposed by things like not only lead and PCBs and even um, pesticides that have been long banned but still find their way into our food and water, but also, um, ex you know, exposed to a lot of these things, even alcohol is a factor. Sure. So what happens is when they exhibit behavioral problems at 15, they might get a diagnosis of conduct disorder. Something, some psychiatric diagnosis describes their um, behavior, but doesn't get to the heart of the problem. Right. So it goes unrecognized. We don't see the connection between behavioral problems, between failing in school, between failing in employment, not being able to hold a job, to the initial exposure that yeah. happened when they're very young. Um, the developing brain, of course, is excellently sensitive to certain things. and the thing that many people, I think, are not aware of, and I was insufficiently aware of, is that um, we know this, uh, Paracelsus said the dose makes the poison, right? Sure. We know that. So anything, including water, can kill you if sure. you drink too much of yeah. it. Yeah, marathon runners die of actually drinking too much water, right, and they get, right. their blood gets diluted, and they get seizures from low sodium in their blood. Yeah, it's, it's true. Right, infamous case of the radio station that had a um, competition, who can drink the most water? A woman died because of that, you know? She took in far too much water, sodium level went down and she was dead. So, but you know, what we don't pay attention to often enough is the fact that timing also makes the problem. Industry scientists will when, the when you get exposed. Exactly, right. exactly. Industry scientists will often say, oh, the amount you're talking about is too small to cause a problem. That might be true in a full-grown, healthy adult with mm -hmm. good nutrition. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about exposure of a child in utero, of a newborn child whose brain is still developing and who is making these neuronal connections that are 
happen with this exquisite choreography. You know, certain structures are developed on a certain day. Neurons migrate on a certain day. And exposure that day yeah. can be devastating to the brain. Yeah. Maybe a week later, it wouldn't have harmed the child. Maybe a week beforehand, it would have had no effect. Certainly an adult would have had no effect, but at that particular time, yeah. the wrong exposure can cause a lifelong disability. Not enough attention paid to that, I think. Yeah, and I, th I think what's also true is that, you know, a lot of these chemicals are studied in isolation. You know, so they go, well, it's a little bit of this, how can it hurt? But the truth is, we're exposed to hundreds and thousands of these chemicals. They're all synergistic, and they actually might not just be additive, they might be multiplied. In other exactly. words, one plus one isn't the effect of two, it might be the effect of 100 or right. 10. And so when you look at the uh, sort of the study done by the Environmental Working Group on 10 newborns, they looked at their umbilical cord blood. I mean, this is before they take their first breath. And this isn't necessarily like poor African-American community, this is just the average person. They had 287 known toxins in their umbilical cord blood before they took their first breath, including about 211 neurotoxins, things like mercury, lead, phthalates, pesticides, glyphosate, flame retardants, PCBs, di uh, even DDT, even though it's been banned for years. And what's fascinating is in, in this country, you know, we we shoot first and ask questions later. Exactly. And I think in Europe, they say, well, you have to prove that this chemical is safe before we include it in anything. In this country, it's like, well, you know, let's use it and see what happens. Exactly. I address that in my book early on, the precautionary principle, the idea that one should test chemicals as they do in the European Union before human exposure. We, European Union does that. But um, we only test after someone's been harmed or, or reports of harm. And Philippe Grandjean at Harvard has listed over 200 chemicals known to affect people's um, neurological development. And most of them are not adequately tested no. before use in humans. So we need and many of the ones that are approved here are banned in Europe. Exactly. So in the European Union, where they don't even release a, t a chemical if the prior testing shows it's harmful, here we don't test it until later. And then after people are harmed or the reports of harm, the most common refrain you hear from industry is, it'll be too expensive to remedy this. You know, It'll be too expensive to test them test our chemicals before we use them in humans. But that's not true. If you look at the expense of um, not only doing the test to certify that their toxicity, but also um, compensating the victims, treating the victims, mm. settling the lawsuits, it's far more expensive yeah. to wait until after people have been harmed to test them. But it's easier for industry because they are, they've become so adept at deflecting um, it's true. management. It's, a, it's yeah. sort of nebulous because you think about, okay, well, people drink too much soda, you can measure their blood sugar, and you see they got diabetes, and you can make a connection. With environmental toxins, there's so many, they're so diffuse, they're everywhere in our skincare products, our household products, in our food, in our water, baby food. in our air. I use the example of baby food, heavily right. painted. Yeah. In our homes. I mean, it's just, you know, we're surrounded in right. a sea of environmental toxins and it's invisible, right? And so the problem is how do you start to connect the dots like you've done in your book and tell the story in a different way that gets people activated about solving this? That is so true. Remember thalidomide? Yeah you know, which cause birth defects, profound birth defects, focomelia in young children after their moms took no a while. No arms, legs, nothing. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, David Rowell said that if the thalidomide had caused a 10-drop um, decrease in IQ rather than the dramatic um, birth yeah. defects, it'd still be on the market. Of course, so. yeah. I mean, the, I read, I'm researching my book, Food Fix, coming out in February, that, that um, you know, because of pesticide use, uh, and, and by the way, most most farm workers are brown and black in this country, and and Hispanic particularly uh, are affected. And there there's a loss of 41 million IQ points just from the use of pesticides because of the exposure of farm workers right. to these chemicals. And, and that's, that's just the, one chemical or a few chemicals. It's not the total load of chemicals, right. which is what really determines our risk. So. So how do we start to sort of think about this in a way that that um, connects the dots better scientifically and also how do we change the healthcare professions so that people start to think about toxins? Because the average doctor knows nothing about toxins or food, which are the two primary drivers of most disease. And, and even worse, I write in my book about the fact that some doctors who are well aware 
that their patients have, um, their patients of color have a strong exposure to toxic substances, don't address that in prenatal visits. And they don't they, know how. And when they've been asked why, one of the things they say is that, well, these are people who already are saddled with so many challenges, survival challenges, just, you know, putting food on the table. And it seems so burdensome to then also tell them, you know, be careful about the fish that you eat, be careful about, you know, the air quality in your home. So they just don't address yeah. it, you know? But that <laughs> silence is deadly. You know, people are, are unaware that these things are killing them as well. And so how can they be expected to take action against them? Yeah. Um, how to address it is really difficult. I think one thing that we definitely need to stop doing, no, start doing, is um, I address the synergy you talk about in my book that is so important because... It's not it, like one plus one equals two. It's so exactly. Much more it's so important, the fact that a single exposure um, and two exposures may add up to more than double the risk, right? So these exposures, uh, that means that the picture is almost certainly worse than what we think it is. You know, if we're measuring the effects of one toxin, we're only getting a woefully small point of the picture. And public health structures should take that in mind because very often industry's mission is to mitigate the damage. Industry's mission is to keep its product on the shelves and to keep from being legislated and to make sure people are, con are continually exposed to it. That's their profitable stance. And so they employ a lot of doubt. You can't prove it's really um, our product that's causing the problem. You can't prove that. And they, um, it's and too diffuse, health, right? Smoking is a cigarette. You get that. But this mm -hmm. is so many things. How do you right. regulate 80,000 chemicals that are out there? In, the, in, in Anniston, the, Alabama, that's what happened. You had so many pollutants in the area that they actually, for a while, were engaged with pointing to each other. Oh, it's not our PCBs. It's the um, lead down the road. It's the DDT that's still in the water, you know. So... <laughs> um, but unfortunately, another public health... Um, so the cement companies are fighting with the... Uh, right. coal companies <laughs> are fighting with the pesticide companies. Yeah, that's And the like answer thing. was, you're all responsible. You know, you're all guilty. Right. But um, one public health development that can be problematic in cases like this is the focus on individual responsibility. Mm. That's a good thing in general, right? It sounds good. And we should be responsible. We shouldn't... Smoke, well, when you turn on the test. tap and poison comes out, it's hard to be responsible. Exactly. But when you, now we're talking about things that people have, individuals have no control over. And you can't evoke it. But that's exactly what has happened in the past. If you look at Baltimore in the not so distant past, they had public health workers coming to Baltimore homes and showing mothers how to clean their floors with spick and span. Implication being that you're not cleaning, that you know your homes are filthy and that's why your kids are sick. Right. No, their kids were sick because lead was everywhere. Yeah. Lead industry had sold lead toys, lead paint, lead, lead um, exhaust from the fuel, and mothers and fathers could do nothing to stem that tide. And yet, this blame the victim continues. So we have to be really careful with uh, personal responsibility because it can easily end up being a blame the victim. Oh, yeah. No, that, that is, it's also true with food. I think, you know, when you talked a little earlier about food swamps and food deserts and food apartheid and segregation around food and it's hard to be personally responsible when you aren't able to have access when you aren't taught what to do when you don't right. know how to cook the right things when you have literally been disenfranchised from your traditional foods or healthy food is simply priced out of your market right you know there are no uh, supermarkets nearby going to the supermarket involves taking a taxi you know or finding transportation and it's too far away so you resort to what you can find nearby, which is going to be the bodega, very poor so, choices, yeah. right, you know? So these Hobson choices that, that parents have to face, like, you know, do I go to McDonald's and feed my whole family within my budget? Or do I go to, or I spend a lot of money to go to a supermarket that I really can't afford to do more than, you know, once every couple of months? Um, yeah. Or do I buy some soggy vegetables <laughs> and try to make a meal out of that? I mean, that's not a choice they should have to make. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, there's a friend of mine that uh, runs a company called Thrive Market, and they lobbied a number of years ago to try to get SNAP to be able to be used online, food stamps, because it wasn't. And uh, there was a recent study done looking at actually what would happen if that was implemented. And hopefully we'll get passed in 2021 to allow the SNAP to be used online. But then you can get cheaper access to food, home delivery of groceries, you know, so that would be great. You know, basically, you know, your 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 food desert ends at the beginning of your internet connection, you know, which <laughs> right. which most people do have. <laughs> and yeah. and so I think I think that that uh, 
you know, the, the, the linkage between environmental toxins and the loss of our intellectual capital uh, is not something that most people are aware of. No. So, I mean, that's why I wrote the book, because I knew it was under the radar, wasn't getting enough attention. And there's alcohol, too. Alcohol is very important. I think that there's a lot of talk, um, a lot of discussion in the 80s and 90s about the hazards of um, high-potency alcohol drinks mm-hmm. that you can't find everywhere. You know, you can't find uh, MD-2020 everywhere. You can't find these these alcoholic beverages that have, they're fortified with more alcohol. I remember I was so naive in the 80s, I thought, oh, that's nice, they're putting vitamins in the alcohol. And I was like, no, 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 they're putting more alcohol in the alcohol, you know? So, so what you, do you mean, it's like 40 proof, 80 proof, what? I don't know the exact proof, but it's very high. They're very high in alcohol, and um, they're, what's interesting is, I've gone to the bodegas to sell them. First of all, it's hard to find them outside of communities of color. So um, I've gone to bodegas that sell them, and what you, you go to the case that has beer in it, there'll be beer there, and then there'll also be fortified malt liquors, which look like beer or bottled like beer, but carry the alcoholic wallop of a whole bottle of wine. Wow. That's how much alcohol's on them. And they're sold in the same case, so young people go there and buy this without realizing that what they're buying, the malt liquor, is something that's far yeah. more potent. Or actually they do, because that's what they want. They want to get, you know, they want a high potent drink that's very cheap. And so um, wow. drinking these things are, is very devastating, but especially to fetuses, because what happens um, very often in communities of color is that there is a lot of unacknowledged fetal alcohol Central, damage. Yeah. So um, what you have is that um, mothers who are, tend to be a bit younger than, than more wealthy and white mothers, but they don't tend to know that they're pregnant for two months. Yeah. During that time, they've been socially drinking. Not alcoholics, but drinking normally. But that social drinking can affect their fetus. Of course. And then the fetus is born with a problem. But very often, the problem will be more subtle than fetal yeah, alcohol syndrome. Yeah, just a little syndrome. bit of lack of... Less, you know, less cognitive. Yeah. But it won't may, won't may not have like the distinctive fe- uh, facial yeah, characteristics. Yeah, the, the, the facial So it's not easily recognized. And we don't screen routinely for fetal alcohols and when kids are born. What happens is we have a lot of scrutiny on mothers that we know are alcoholics. A lot of scrutiny on um, Native American mothers, but not scrutiny on Hispanic and black mothers. Yeah. So they have children with this problem, and again, they're diagnosed when they're, you know, in their late teens or 20s as having something else, some other problem. And so this fetal alcohol damage is going unrecognized, and a lot of it has to do with having targeted marketing of high potency alcoholic drinks mm-hmm. in these communities. And I also want to point out, if I haven't already, that we t- are talking about um, African American communities, and I think there's an, well, I know, people tend to assume that it's um, low income, socioeconomics, it's a problem. But uh, every, all the poisoning issues equally pertain to African Americans who are um, middle class, elderly middle class, and really? living in the suburbs, yes. Um, there are many communities that are suburban communities, fully employed, that if they were not African American, um, there'd be no reason for them to be the uh, foci of Superfund sites or be exposed to toxic waste, but they are. Um, Why is that? Because because it's a matter of race. Because they're segregated communities. So they're, they're, no, 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 no. We're talking about we're talking about communities that are African American um, and are suddenly middle class. I mean, I think the 2017 study showed that African Americans with median incomes between fifty and sixty thousand dollars are exposed to far more toxicity than white communities with incomes of ten thousand. Because they live in neighborhoods that are more likely to be exposed to environmental toxins because of... Well, it's actually the exact opposite. They are living in communities that should not be exposed to, but they are because of race. Um, why? Why, the why is that syndrome, happening? The NIMBY syndrome, NIMBY right? syndrome, Not in my backyard. It's kind of a zero-sum game, right? Whites understand that... Um, a lot of this is political clout, right? Whites understand that these toxins are going to be located somewhere. Nobody wants them in their neighborhood, right? So whites who have some political clout or power or representatives with little clout of power will fight legally to prevent the sighting of them in their communities. And so it's by default that they're sighted in African American and Hispanic yeah. communities. Yeah. They don't have as much clout. Political gerrymandering or mobs of power, also home ownership. Remember the redlining we talked about earlier? People who don't own their own homes are much more vulnerable to this kind of thing. You don't mm-hmm. have the clout to fight it. 
Hmm. You know, if the homeowner doesn't have really have a problem with it, then you're stuck. Mm-hmm. So that happens often. But even homeowners in places like Anniston find that their communities are targeted. That's where the dumping happens. That's where the illegal, not illegal and illegal siting of toxic waste happen because they're because of racism. Because whites don't want it. Either mm-hmm. do blacks, but blacks tend not to have, have the political, political powers, power. Yeah. So, wow. so it's not so having. Um, being middle class, doesn't even owning your own you. home, doesn't protect you. If mm. you're black, um, you're still more likely to be a victim here. So um, Robert Bullard has documented this very heavily in places like um, Houston, for example. Robert Mueller, the Mueller report guy? Wh- which report? You said Mueller, Robert Mueller, is that who you said? No, 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 Robert Bullard, sorry. Oh, Bullard, I'm <laughs> yeah. like, wow, okay. The father of environmental racism. Got <laughs> so, it. Yeah. So, you know, this is clearly an issue. There are Clearly, people like you talking and writing about it and others, you know, has this achieved any awareness within local, state, federal legislatures or governments? Because it had. It had until the current administration. Actually, the Environmental Protection Agency was not doing everything it should have done, but it was making progress, steady progress. Actually, um, over the last couple of administrations, partly because of people like Mustafa Ali, who was a very powerful... um, head of environmental racism programs there. But he resigned because the Trump administration has been um, consistently rolling back the progress that had been made over the last few mm-hmm. administrations. Um, for example, there were only four chloralkali plants um, left operational in this country. And those produce a ton of mercury. Exactly. But we'd done a really good job. Only four were open, and they were scheduled to close last year. But the EPA under Trump decided to cancel the closing. They're still operational. They're going to continue to be operational. Um, Here's a little known fact you may not know, but in the processing of corn to make high fructose corn syrup, they often use chloralkali, mm-hmm. which means that there's actually mercury in a lot of soda and other products that are sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. That's charming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good Very, to know. There's yeah. actually a research paper on that. It was written a number of years ago. It's pretty frightening. Yeah. Even the surprise inspections that have been a constant um, under the EPA. Last year, the EPA also um, decided to end all surprises. So we're not going to come and check out your factory to make sure it's kosher. Oh, we're we'll gonna... check it out. We're going to tell you beforehand. Yeah. So it's going to be much less effective, right? right. <laughs> You're going to clean things up or hide anything you don't want to be seen. You know. Yeah. So it's going to invalidate the purpose of the inspection. So the EPA has been especially desultory under the Trump administration, and ha- we've been going backwards steadily. Hmm. So so let's talk about lead poisoning a little bit more because it's it's a big deal. I mean, even though we've gotten rid of leaded paint, leaded gas, it's still in many homes and communities of, uh, of color are more affected. And, you know, it costs the United States $50 billion a year. Uh, you, you say it costs 23 million IQ points in our children every year. I mean... <laughs> Yes. We're, we're basically destroying the future generation's ability we to be competitive. spent $50 billion, dollars, yeah. And it, it, nearly two out of every five American African-American homes in Baltimore have lead-based paint. Almost all the 37,500 Baltimore children who suffered from lead poisoning between 2003 and 2015 were African-American. And so, that's an underestimate. So, yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know. Because the testing that they've been using to establish whether the kids um, have lead poisoning is faulty. You mean the blood work? Yes. Tell, tell us about that. And, and, oh, and just and, the test and, it was found to be faulty. It was found to consistently produce un- underestimates, but it, but they continue to use it. I in Baltimore, I've meaning been, just a whole blood lead level. Yes. Is why does it underestimate the? Because the testing is faulty. What do you mean? The test is faulty. It's been known to be. I mean, faulty. it's not accurate. It doesn't. It doesn't work well. It's not accurate. Uh huh. Well, it's interesting. You know, as a functional medicine doctor. Uh, you know, I've been focused on environmental toxins for decades, and 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 the way we test for them doesn't make sense, right? Mm-hmm. Because particularly the heavy metals like mercury and lead, they only stay in your blood for a short period of time, maybe 90 days. They're either excreted, a portion of them are excreted in your urine and stool, but a lot of them are then stored in your tissues and organs, like your brain and your muscles and your bones. <laughs> and so you can measure lead levels in bones. And so... Measuring someone's lead level in their blood actually only reflects what their recent exposure was, but mm-hmm. they could have been exposed heavily early on and then not later, and then it'll look like normal, but they still have high levels of lead. And uh, there was an article in the New York Times about 
special forces, um, which we've been treating in Cleveland Clinic, who had very high levels of mercury and lead because they were working in blast houses. And we treated them with chelation, which is not right. a standard medical treatment, although for acute lead poisoning, DMSA is, a, is an approved drug, but it's not widely used. And there's nothing, quote, nothing that can be done about it, they say. But in fact, that's not true. Mm-hmm. And for the, the one of the lead researchers at Mount Sinai in lead poisoning saw the before and after Who bone scans. I can't remember his name. But Landrigan? It was, no, okay. not Phil Landrigan, but I know Phil very well. So the 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 professor at Mount Sinai was like, well, we've never seen lead levels come down in blood before. And I'm like, yes, because you don't know how to treat the people with lead. So I think, you know, for those listening, you know, it, it can be fatalistic to say, well, we're all poisoned, we're all toxic, it's, we've already d- done the damage. And I can tell you clinically, from my point of view, I was mercury poisoned from living in China, and thousands of patients that I've treated with lead and mercury poisoning, they get better when you treat them. And there's a science to how to detoxify from heavy metals and how to upregulate your body's own systems for getting rid of pesticides and chemicals and so forth. So there's a way to do it. I've written a lot about it, but I think it's, it's important for people listening to understand that it's not a done deal. If you've been affected, if you think your children's been affected, that there are ways of treating this, but they're not within the traditional healthcare system. It's important, I think, because futility is uh, part, one of the things we're up against. Yeah. Futility is a problem. If you assume that nothing can be done, nothing will be done. You know? Right. And I do make the point in my book that chelation and other methods can help people. Um, I worked with some lawyers in Baltimore who have um, representing clients who've been lead poisoned. Mm. And um, I've been, you know, I find it really inspiring when they tell me about kids who had been written off essentially as having been hopelessly injured by lead poisoning, mm-hmm. but with the proper treatment, after they win a settlement, they're able to um, go on. Some of them have gone on to college, you know, yeah. and performed quite well. So yeah. I think that's a really important point you've made. And I, I think if you just look at traditional medicine, there, there's other than just stopping the exposure, there's no treatment. And yet we know, for example, high levels of zinc and vitamin C, which often these kids are deficient in, help to remove mercury. There's drugs like DMSA. There's things like glutathione. There's binders. There's all sorts of strategies we use in functional medicine to help mobilize and get rid of toxins. And I can tell you, I've seen kid after kid who's had cognitive impairment, who's had behavioral issues, who's had aggression, who's you know, had dyslexia, learning difficulties, which are all related to these toxins actually get better. So, you know, we're, we're, we really haven't one named the problem very well. We don't, we're not good at identifying the problem. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's, it's a problem. Like I, I, you know, even things like glyphosate, we think is, you know, that's affects everybody in this country, but it's, 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 it's one of the biggest, uh, actually it's the most abundant used, uh, industrial chemical glyphosate, which is round up to, it's an herbicide and it's, it's, you know, there's more glyphosate uh, than vitamin D or vitamin A in Cheerios, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is fortified with vitamin D, and vitamin A. And I, I think that affects kids' microbiome. It affects their gene expression, affects generations. And, and, you know, but there are ways to help reduce it and treat it. I think that's important for people to be empowered about. So from, from, from this whole idea of, of these, these, these communities who are, are marginalized with these toxic effects, these chemicals, what, what else can be done uh, you know, either locally, nationally, uh, individually. Well, I devoted what? two chapters of my book to that. Yeah. In chapter six, I talk about what individuals can do to um, exercise more control, not perfect control, but more control over their own environment, detoxify their own environment. And there are many things you can do in your home. It's important to understand, though, that, as we said before, an individual cannot alone, you know, eliminate this problem. It's not an individual responsibility. But in your home, you can do certain things. If you live too near a bus depot or are, um, you know, gas fumes from passing vehicles because lead has been reduced greatly but not eliminated in fuels in this country, then there are things you can do like run the air conditioner, keep your doors shut if you can afford to do that. And I point out that there's funding available to help individuals to do Uh that. I talk about the vermin in their homes, which have also been shown to cause disease that lowers cognition and things you can do to help eliminate those vermin. You mean uh, like cockroaches and dust mites? I mean like and... cockroaches, dust mites, and rodents. Rodents are a largely unrecognized um, source of hantaviruses. Soul virus, for example, has been tied to hypertension, which in turn has been tied to lowered cognition over time. So getting rid of these rodents is more than an aesthetic you know, concern. It's a very immediate health con- concern. Mm-hmm. And people who rent 
often feel powerless because it's not their property. Um, they, you know, they have control maybe over their own apartment, but not neighboring apartments. There's limits on what they can do. But I point out the legal help that's available to them because most laws and most municipalities say that the owner of the home is responsible for keeping the area vermin free. Yeah, and also so they can use lead, that for lead remediation energy. is legally mandated, but it's not being done by landlords. Right. right? So I talk in detail about Why the is type that? of... I mean, this was sort of shocked me in, in Cleveland. I was like, well, aren't these homes in Cleveland required by law to actually be remediated from lead if people live You'll in find them? the same thing in Baltimore. The laws exist, but in it's my opinion. I have to label it as opinion because I can't actually document it in most cities. But in cities I've looked at, you have municipal concerns that the landlords who actually own the property will simply abandon properties if you force them to clean it them up. It costs too much. You know, it'll yeah, it costs too much to get rid of the lead. It costs too much to get rid of the rodents. I'm just going to leave this place. I'm just going to abandon it. And then the city loses squat. tax revenue. So they are, in my opinion, not always as assiduous as they should be in enforcing the law where it yeah. exists. You know? But still, there are things that people can do. They could, there's also OSHA. You know, um, depending on the use of the building. So I detail a lot of that for readers so they will know so where to go. So practical things about how things to they can get do help. In their own environment. Yeah. Then the next chapter I talk about um, communities uniting to get help from the government and other agencies and to try to clean up their own areas. And the thing is that um, these communities, I try to stress to people, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There already exists a lot of agencies that have been very successful in helping other communities, and you can benefit from what other people have gone through to try to get your own area attention that it needs so that you will end up having... Um, the EPA essentially is going to have to be forced to do what it mm -hmm. should do by its um, yeah. own state. And I talk about ways to do that. There is, um, I'm sure you're familiar with that, Earth Justice, wonderful organization. Yeah. I love their motto, because the earth needs a good lawyer. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's what these people do need. When you organize to try to expel these sources of illness from your community, you're going to need legal clout, yeah. and they can provide it. So That's amazing. I, t I, I try to give this blueprint for people not only to, take, to clean up their own homes, but also to clean up their own communities, the places where they live and um, banish the, the sources of poison. Because um, unfortunately, EPA is not going to do it for you. You're going to have to do it for yourself. Yeah, thank you. This is amazing. Uh, I want to just shift tracks a little bit because in your book, you also talk about uh, the issues around food and yes. food swamps and food injustice and how they're connected, both environmental and, and food racism in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I mean, you can Google food racism and you'll see almost nothing. Like, it, it just doesn't come up except a talk I gave at the uh, Riverside Church in Harlem about food oppression. But other than that, there's very few things written about the deliberate um, and often unrecognized uh, sort of food racism. And it's often targeting the poor and minorities. It affects the same way their cognitive function. So we know just as environmental toxins cause loss of cognitive function, so does nutritional deficiencies, so does sugar and processed food. So how, how, do, how do you see these issues as linked and what, what, how would you describe the problem? Well, semantic point first. Although the food racism you describe is real, I tend not to use the word racism. I use it for environmental racism because it's a specific you know, variant. But racism is like a tricky word. Um, studies have shown that different people interpret it differently, yeah. which makes it Pretty useless for communication. Right, frankly, it's not you know? a great. It's, yeah. it's kind of people are allergic yeah. to it, right? Yeah, and but the reason uh, yeah. I, I the reason I, I use it is because it, it it's meant to get people upset. It's meant to get people. Yeah, it's to accurate, think that, but I find for communication it's not always yeah. optimal. Yeah, okay? I'm not always good at that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like just to call it like it is. Yeah. So, but in terms of um, policies that drive this. One, you know, one can go back as far as you like. It's very nuanced. Uh, there are a lot of things that are going on that have historical import. But if you talk about what's happening now, essentially it's a factor of um, capitalism. Um, people who supply foods are driven by the profit motive. They're not driven necessarily by optimizing your health. And so when, they, when they're in areas where people ha tend to have a low income, and uh, tend to have higher rates of unemployment, 
they often find that it doesn't suit their bottom line to locate there. So you're not going to have supermarkets with an abundance of fresh, nutritious, safe food, organic food, et cetera, offered in these areas. Instead, you're going to have bodegas, uh, fast food places that are, you know, heavy on the cheap, but extremely non-nutritious food, you know, mm -hmm. filled with fat, sugar, et cetera, chemicals. Um, so that's what people are stuck with. Yeah. And increasingly, and so absent some kind of um, control or regulation by government, that's what people are going to continue to be stuck with. Um, there are some things that have worked in some communities, but the reality is it's fine to say, as people have said, that these communities could get together and have community gardens and grow their own food, and mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. But you're often talking with people who are engaged in survival yeah. and don't have time to work in their garden. They're too busy just trying to keep a roof over their heads. You yeah. know? So um, it's really important for the government to step in and do some regulation. And some people, of course, I know that there are people who feel it's not the government's role. I disagree. I think that it's really important, especially if you look at the long-term effects. Who ends up paying the cost, the financial <laughs> cost, right. when people are sickened disproportionately because they have had a whole lifetime with, without right. eating poor food? Right. We pay it, the taxpayer. Yes. It's Medicaid. Yes. You know? Medicare, um, so Medicaid, yeah. that gives the government, I think, the right to step in and dictate to companies, okay, you want to remain profitable, we understand that, but you also are going to maintain food centers in these areas, yeah. you know? And I think that's what needs to be done. And we need to find, have a government that's willing to do that. To well, I mean, that. I think in this country, we're really good at privatizing the profits and socializing the costs. <laughs> Very well said. Meaning, yeah. you know, the true cost of the food isn't paid for at the checkout counter or in the restaurant or at the McDonald's, you know, counter. It's paid for by destruction of the environment through how we grow the food and climate change is paid for by the uh, subsidization of that farming by the government, our taxpayer. It's paid for by the government for, for example, for SNAP or food stamps where 75% of the food is actually processed food and about 10% is soda. The biggest line item is soda. And then we pay for it by having to pay for the chronic disease that's caused by that, which is diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and so forth, that, is, you know, really literally trillions of dollars every year that are paid for in a society by health insurance companies and the government. And we, so we pay for that as citizens through our tax dollars, and we're not actually having the companies held accountable for the exactly. downstream consequences of their food and their products, just like the same thing as, you know, the consequences of the pollution that you're seeing in these communities they're not paying for the loss of cognitive. I mean, how much is a how much is an IQ point worth? I mean, how do you measure that in a kid? You know, how, the quality of their life, their ability to succeed, their exactly. ability to go to school, their ability to actually function. Lead poisoning costs us fifty billion dollars, or you know, that one twenty three million IQ points per year. By either measure, it's far too much, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, so we really have to start thinking about how do we how do we start to like get real about this and 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 change the food system in a way that. One, not only provides access, but also sort of changes the, the economic equation. Why is it so much cheaper to buy a can of soda than a bottle of water? I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you go buy a bottle of water, it's nine, uh, it's nine cents an ounce. Soda is two cents an ounce. <laughs> you know, like if you go, for example, on, on Amazon, you can buy a big bottle of smart water for you know, nine cents an ounce or a bottle of a same, you know, a bottle of Pepsi, for example, for two cents an ounce. So how is that right or fair, right? It's absurd. It's it is crazy. absurd. Cause um, and considering Pepsi is mostly water. <laughs> right. Exactly. So um, the companies are going to have to be forced to do what's right and to make their products available to um, everyone who needs it. Yeah. I mean, there's people where they, they can be sure of making a lot of money. So there's tremendous health disparities in this country that are, are caused by, by the environmental impact you talked about, but also the food issues. And I think 
um, we're, we're, we're seeing this at huge scales. I mean, if you're African-American, you're 80% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes, almost twice as likely probably, four times as likely to have kidney failure, three and a half times as likely to get amputations as whites. The uh, kidney failure is really interesting because I remember I was at the Harvard Global Public Health when New England Journal of Medicine um, published an article that essentially asked the question, why are um, African-Americans four times as likely African-American diabetics four times as likely to go into end-stage renal failure mm. as whites. And they began positing all these possible reasons. It could be genetics, it could be this, it could be that, on and on and on. I read the article and I said, they don't mention toxicity, even though we know that African-Americans are, more, are exposed more heavily to toxicity, not only in the, their homes, but in the workplace. Mm-hmm. I said that, and my professor said, you're right, that should be uh, a key factor. But they didn't even bring it up. It wasn't even on the No, radar. you're right. I mean, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a number of years ago, there was an article where they looked at people with, all people with, with sort of early kidney failure who were going to progress to get dialysis, which is an enormous cost. I mean, it's just an enormous cost. And what they found was that if they treated them for, and they all had a lot of lead toxicity, mm-hmm. they treated them with EDTA intravenous chelation for lead, that their progression to needing dialysis was halted, which you think would be now standard practice. Exactly. <laughs> it wasn't in some third rate journal from like, you know, China. It was a peer reviewed top medical journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association, publishing this paper that just completely went ignored. And yet I see this. I see patients with toxicity and renal issues and we treat them and they get better. I mean, I, I had a patient come the other day who was he had a lot of reasons for his kidney issues, but he saw his nephrologist and the nephrologist was like, I've never seen people's kidney failure get better. It just is a one-way street. I don't know how you did this, you know, and we, we changed his diet, we got him healthy, mm-hmm. we fixed all those things and it's it's a huge issue. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the, and this is a tough question, but the African-American community, I think, you know, is is disproportionately affected by the food system and by environmental toxins but often uh, there's not a sense of like awareness or empowerment to fight these issues you know we have black lives matter which is about you know the you judicial system and empowerment you mean on the part of african americans yeah like i think people are people get i'm up, not sure that's true because I, you know, in fact, I, I know differently. I well, mean, I'd like to hear that because I, I, I see the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement about, you know, the criminal justice system. And but do you see Black Lives Matter because it's publicized by the news media. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is that the concern of, among African Americans about food issues is often not publicized by the news. It often remains under the radar, mm. or even worse, is mischaracterized. Mm. Um, I lecture frequently not only to medical schools and medical ethics institutions, but also to communities. And it is actually the most frequently um, cited issue. So what are the conversations? I'm not even speaking about food issues for the most part, but it always comes up immediately. So what are the conversations you're hearing? Well, there's a lot of understanding. First of all, there's a lot of concern about um, the importance of eating well and maintaining health on one's own because many people have justified trust issues with the medical establishment and frankly want to avoid it as long as I can. I don't think that's the right approach, but I understand why they think that. And the, just the, and for people who don't know why, the history of the Tuskegee experiment was essentially Not what, really Tuskegee, actually. It's everything else. Um, oh, really? And that's a whole other conversation. Well, just but quickly for those my, who don't know. My book, Medical Apartheid, actually f- focuses on that, yeah. There's a long history of abusive medical research uh, with African Americans and the focus on Tuskegee, but the other studies were actually much worse huh. and were very dense. I have 15 whole chapters, wow. and only one of them mentions Tuskegee. Wow. So, um, and not only in the past, but in the present, there are present day issues. There's one going on right now that I'm I'm involved in, in Baltimore, of course, <laughs> happening in Baltimore, where um, we have young black men who are being actively recruited into studies without their knowledge where they're going to be forced into hypothermia as treatment for gunshot wounds. Wow. Yes, really chilling. Anyway, these concerns mean that many African Americans seek to avoid um, getting sick, avoid the healthcare system, and they and they focus very heavily on food as a way of doing that. And so um, I'm often, they often come with very precise questions to me that I can't answer, but they're concerned about not only eating the right things, 
but even concerned about brands. Um, the brand of the bottled water they drink. It's like the last talk I gave, which didn't deal with nutrition at all, I was asked by a knot of people who were taking notes, which brand of bottled water should they, should they um, eat? Or they'll talk about the fact that they avoid meat, that they have a vegan diet, and they also avoid dairy. I mean, they're very, um, it's very meticulous. It's very precise. And there's a great deal of concern about this. But I've noticed that it typically doesn't get addressed in the news media. And hmm. I'll leave any you to speculate by why that would be. But yeah. it's something that you don't see addressed in other. You own, You have to be in the community to see and hear this. I mean, today, you know, I, I would wonder, you know, the, you know the, for example, the soda companies target the poor minorities much further than than every other other community, and and yet, um, you know, there's the, there's not an outcry. For example, I, I, I talked to American African American pastors and said, why don't you get up on the podium and go, hey, look, this is a form of of targeting and targeted that's, marketing yeah, that's look, affecting look at, us in our communities. And I, there's a pa- pastor in Baltimore, uh, Del Mar Coates, who says, you know, we're losing more people to the sweets than the streets. And I think... But let's look at the facts. Who drinks soda? You're speaking as if this is a minority issue, as if African Americans are. But 85% of the people in this country are white. Only. Yes. Okay. They drink the soda, soda too. The soda companies would go out of business if they were targeted African Americans. Uh, Americans are drinking soda. So, and think it's about true, it. It's true, but, but a, the data even, are really clear that, that, that African Americans do drink more. And, ki- and African American kids do drink more because they're, they're targeted. What does, when you say more, what do you mean? More by volume or more by rate? The rate may be higher, but the fact that these are so few people, even right. if, even a if you have of the population, it's less. But for, even a much lower rate of soda consumption among whites would still mean that they would far outstrip African Americans in consumption. In terms of the total amount of sold, of course. Exactly. But I'm talking about sort of per capita consumption. Then, okay. It's that's, much higher. But it's important to specify that. Yeah. 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 But we're talking about per capita. But if we're talking about per capita, then the question is why are we talking about per capita? Because if, we're ta- if we know the rate of consumption among whites, which I don't know, and I'm assuming you don't have at your fingertip, but if we knew the rate, we'd have a better picture of what's going on. It's about double for, for African Americans. Which would kids. make the weight rate among whites what? Uh, I, I don't know. The, the, I have it in one of my books I re- wrote about years ago. But basically what I remember was that the, the number, uh, the amount of soda consumed by African-American kids is twice that of white kids. Well, I think that it's really important to understand we're not talking about a racial issue there. We're talking about an American issue. Because if you're talking about the rate of consumption, that's one thing. We're talking about consumption. It's largely driven by whites. Whites are an important factor here, too. Sure. I, I think we're just maybe sort of not quite talking about the same thing. I, I, what I'm suggesting is that that these communities are far more affected by diabetes and obesity, which are caused by sugar and processed food and s- soda in large part. And they're consuming more of it because they're targeted. For example, in SNAP, when you go to a suburban neighborhood, they're not advertising on SNAP days when people get their SNAP card for more soda. But you go to the bodegas, they're advertising heavily for the $2 bottle of two liter soda. So they're, they are- the targeted marketing is, is, is a constant in the African American community. Yeah. My point is that if one's not careful about quantity and things like consumption, then it can play into a subtle form of blaming the victim. Mm. Not by you, of course, but by others, people yeah. who take it up. And I see this happen very frequently. You know, The focus on African-American behavior, like soda consumption, in a vacuum, gives the impression that it's not a behavior that's of, of consequence to other people. Which, you know, your work- Of course it is, no, of course it is, yeah. yeah. Your work is like, you focus on this. And yeah. And it's obvious that you don't think that. But I'm thinking about all the people For who sure. read a newspaper article For sure. and come away with the wrong impression. Well, what I'm saying is not personal choice. They they have they have um, targeted marketing to them. They're 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 actually their communities are full of this stuff at incredibly low prices. And my question to you was really, does the African American community get that they're being victimized by the food industry and that that's a subtle form of, of sort of racism? They absolutely do. But I think also there's no monolithic African American community. As I've told That's you, fair. many African Americans <laughs> are are very concerned about mm-hmm. nutrition, and um, many would as soon you know shoot themselves as drink a soda. I mean, yeah, something for that. sure. And then you have others who again 
with actually fewer choices. You know, um, a parent's head of a household with yeah. marginal, marginal jobs, they have to, they, they're doing what they can do to put food on the table. And yeah. so they, they're going to resort to buying that two liter bottle of soda for their kids, you know, because they don't have many mm -hmm. choices. So those are very different situations and very mm. different people. Mm. So I think it's really important to for sure, it for sure. It's a it's a complex problem, no but doubt. But I think, but I do know that the many many African Americans who are um, very focused on nutrition and eating healthily and eating the right things don't get the same media attention. Yeah, for sure. As those who are presented as having problematic choices. No, I agree. I just think I think we just have to sort of name that that that, that the, there is a f sort of a system of food injustice there's a system of food apartheid mm -hmm. and that it's real um and that and that it is targeting communities of color in ways that are really unfortunate and need to be fixed and that's and really those what pressures I, do need to be fixed absolutely. yeah and i think the question i have for you is you know you know you've thought a lot about this and and you, you know you say that there is hope like we don't have to be sort of discouraged completely that if we work together we can fix these problems so what are the the most important changes you'd like to see in terms of public policy and and how do we think about solutions and strategies to maximize the intelligence of our nation as a whole and and communities of color yeah there's so many but as i've said um in chapter six and seven of my book i lay them out in great detail and also how to do them not just this is what you ought to do yes but here's who can help you do it but the overview is that first of all we need a functioning epa an EPA that will take its mission to protect our land, food, and water seriously. Right now, we have an EPA that is is, seems to be dedicated to doing nothing and to rolling back the advances we've already made. Yes. So we also need to have municipal governments that will not only correct issues, but stop lying to people. It's a constant feature that in every city I write about, yeah. at one point, the city government has lied to the sufferers about whether or not they're being exposed to toxins. Yes. If you don't know that you're being exposed to lead or PCBs, um, then you can't do anything about it, you know, right. if you're being lied to. And also, I think it's really important for people who live in communities that are being assailed by these toxins to organize, to realize that they're going to have to save themselves until we clean up our act as a government, but that they're not alone in doing that. You know, that can be done. Public health has got to not only scrutinize very heavily any messages about personal responsibility, yeah. public health has to do a better job of medical journalism. You talked about the, um, the journals that have very high prestige and are cited frequently, but I have written repeatedly about many of the deep flaws in medical reporting. Yes. In journals in like the media. Journal, journal of, no, journal of, no, New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah. You know, American JAMA, all really? these journals are being influenced by corporations. Interesting. And they, uh, which are successfully... Not just pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm, well, largely pharmaceutical, but not completely. And they are influencing the messages and distorting the information available to doctors. So doctors are essentially being lied to by these journals very often. You know, the journals will say we're peer-reviewed and you can trust us. But they can't um, uphold this promise of purity because they often don't see the original. In fact, they don't see the original data. Right. So they don't know how the data have been processed before they get it. Yes. There have been many cases where um, companies who use medical writers to write the journals, not the doctors whose names actually That's are on true. the journal. These companies have withheld information. Yes. Um, like COX-2 inhibitors. They withheld information about heart, heart attacks and deaths. So doctors couldn't know it and kept prescribing them. So anyway, when it comes to environmental problems, you see the same kind of things. Not only do they publish articles which are erroneous, but they ignore information that is of paramount importance. Um, so we don't know about a lot of exposures that we should know about. So public health and medical reporting have to do a much better job of you know, not only reporting accurately, without corporate influence, but also reporting about things that are important. One of the things I had a problem with in writing the book was I wanted to write about subsistence fishing, when people fish in order to yes. add, you oh, know, yeah, I was add bring to that their up. diets, right? I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I called a researcher at Johns Hopkins, by the way, a researcher who had been very sympathetic to environmental racism. And she told me, oh, forget it. There's no data on African Americans in fishing. Um, on Asians, but not African Americans. African Americans don't do that. I said, oh, yes, they do. I've lived in an African-American community. I see it very often. My own father went fishing and hunting to support his family of yes. seven, you know? And um, 
I said, I, it happens frequently. She said, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. <laughs> oh, jeez. And that is actually the mentality. Well, yeah, I mean, the yeah. Tr- truth is that, you know, every single river and lake in this country is polluted. And if you're fishing, subsistence fishing out of these, which and are often around urban areas, the fish are highly polluted, toxic, and that's getting into uh, right. people. And, you know, there are things still that people can do to protect themselves. I mean, if you, frankly... If you think that you have to do the fishing, support your family, you can choose certain fish that are l- less polluted. You can choose smaller fish. You can find waterways that are less polluted. I mean, mm-hmm. there are things you can do. But these it's have tough. not been, yeah, but you know, the data isn't there. I mean, these are things that should be investigated. They're very important. Well, I mean, the data isn't there for, for African Americans, maybe, but the data from the EPA was really clear. I looked at all the rivers and lakes in America, and every single one. You wouldn't want to eat the fish out of. Well, the data isn't there for African Americans. I'm writing about African Americans, so yeah. that's what I, that's the data that yeah, I needed. Yeah. Um, and what happened was, fortunately for me, literally six weeks before I finished the book, finally a report was issued, an Haynes report, and they not only documented um, African American fishing, but they also had like this little note chiding from the researcher saying, "This has been ignored for too long. We should have done this study a very long yeah. time ago." Yeah. You know. So those are things that should need to so happen. So there's a lot of things that can happen to yes. fix this. And I think uh, your book is really a great testament to, one, um, exposing this issue and naming the issue, and then also solving, helping solve the problem by laying out a whole series of strategies that could be implemented. Thank you. That's what I'm trying to do. Well, I hope everybody gets to read this book. It's called A Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism and Its Assault on the American Mind. I mean, when you think of the amount of intellectual and human capital it's lost because of environmental toxins and also the food system. It's staggering and it's fixable. So thank you, Harriet, for the work you do, for being on the podcast. Uh, If you love this podcast, I'd love you to share with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast and we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Thanks so much. Thank you.